spoke it to be. You were the King of Kings. Yeah, you were, yeah, you were, and now you're reigning still, enthroned above all things. Angels and saints cry out, we'll join them as we sing. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. Shouts and sings the greatness of our King. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God forever. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. your name. 
nothing can stand against and I choose to praise glorify glorify the name of our names and nothing can stand against and I choose to Choose to praise, glorify, glorify the name of our names. And nothing can stand against any yes I will lift you high in the lowest valley. And yes I will bless your name.
Good morning. Turn your scriptures to 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 11. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we're thankful this day to meet here in this building to worship you together. We thank you for bringing Pastor Dave back to heal them from their COVID experience. We thank you for the love which you give us. We ask that you be with those here in charge and during the week as they work that they may have your spirit be with them, give them guidance and strength. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. It's good to be back. Uh, I went and got tested because I had visited a couple people. I had a raspy throat and minor cough. And I went in and I told the PA, I have this every winter. I go out right now and run, walk. Rapid test was negative. I'm like, that's great. Eight hours later, out, well, got bad news. It's positive. So rough 64 years was great. Never, ever in the hospital. July, hernia. October, kidney stone. December, COVID. So I'm looking forward to 2022 in a great year. I appreciate the prayers, the cards, um, and the reaching out to us. Uh, Sandy's coming along. She tested a couple days after me, positive, and I think tomorrow she's out of quarantine. So it's great to be part of this body of believers, and I'm thankful that all I had was a minor symptoms. But I've been praying, and I was going to do uh, two-part series on heaven and hell, and the first part was going to be on hell, the second part heaven, and I thought that's not a great way to start the new year talking about hell. <laughs> and then I was going to do Judges, that's one of my favorite Old Testament books, I started on Judges and wrote a sermon or two, and I, and I thought, I need to do a series on joy, journey toward joy, because the past two years, 2020 and 2021, have been trying times. We know we've struggled through a lot of stressful situations. The pandemic of COVID, political up unheav upheaval, inflation, uh, division at all kinds of levels, all kinds of situations. There's this ongoing debate about climate control, protest after protest, an increase in violent uh, crimes, um, hatred being spewed out. And uh, that's just the national picture. But then there's the personal battles many of us have wrestled with, loss of a loved one, loss of a job, marriages on the rocks or dissolved, family members struggling with alcohol or drugs or some other kind of addiction, loss of friendships, sadly because of political differences or differences over the vaccine and mask mandates. There's great debate about school curriculum. And as I sat down, I was working on today's sermon, I was reminded of the toll that this stress has taken on our community as well as our entire nation. An increasing number of individuals of all ages have admitted to experiencing some level of depression or anxiety. And I just recently talked with someone that's working on her master's degree in um, social work. And she was actually hired in a local school district, hasn't completed her master's degree, but the person, the social worker in the school left, so they hired her. And she's in, a, a, in the greater Johnstown area, pretty wide area, but she's in a school district. And she said to me, I don't have enough time to see all the students that want to talk to me because of anxiety, because of stress, because of depression. Some have expressed they feel this anxiety. Others say, you know what, honestly, if I'm going to be honest, I feel pretty hopeless. With all this in mind, I'm reminded anew that Jesus said he came to give life. 
and an abundant, a full life. He told his disciples in Jerusalem's upper room in what is called the upper room discourse, he said, what I'm talking to you about, what I'm sharing with you is intended to produce joy in you, a complete, a full joy. The apostle John wrote the New Testament letter we know as 1 John, and he told his readers, I write to you, in some versions it says so that our joy, in other versions it says your joy may be complete. Paul wrote a letter to the church at Philippi, Paul was writing from Rome in a prison. And that letter of Philippians is often referred to as the epistle of joy. I said I love the Bible, I love the Old Testament. Nehemiah is a great book about rebuilding. Nehemiah 8.10 says, The joy of the Lord is my strength. Do you know that the Bible mentions the word joy over 150 times in the Bible, and you can see on the bulletin, we're told to go out with joy in Isaiah 55, 12. We're told to sing for joy. Psalm 5, verse 11. We're told in Psalm 100, verse 1, to shout for joy to the Lord. James 1, 2. Consider it pure joy when you fall into various trials. We like to quote that verse to other people when they're going through a trial. But when someone quotes it to us in our trial, we're like, well, I know the verse, but I'm not really relishing hearing I'm supposed to be joyful. Hernia, kidney stones, COVID, rejoice in the Lord. Okay, you say to do that, Lord. We should be different as Christians. Romans 12, 12, rejoice in hope. In Philippians 4, 4, he's writing to the believers in Philippi. Remember, he's in prison. And he says, rejoice in the Lord sometimes. Always rejoice in the Lord. I can go on and on, on, but hopefully you get the point. God wants his children to have joy. A joy that goes above and beyond any and all circumstances we find ourselves in. But too many of us, if we're going to be honest, and some after the first service said, that was me, we walk in, we find ourselves defeated by whatever life is tossing our way. We're discouraged. We're anything but joyful. In fact, we could more accurately say we're miserable, depressed, stressed, anxious, And we feel, some of us, like, I'm just about to go down for the count. I don't know if I can take anything else. And I said at the first service, the next point in your bulletin, it says the first fruit. And I kind of get humored when people go, "Uh, that verse you gave us, it was the wrong verse. This says the first fruit of the Spirit is joy. Actually, it's the second, so you don't need to come up to me after and say it's the second. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. And I can name them all, but I don't want to belabor the point. It's the Holy Spirit who produces the joy in our lives. It's a supernatural joy as we yield control of our lives to the Holy Spirit. And that's where a large part of the problem comes into play for us. Many Christians, too many Christians today, are not willing to surrender 100% of themselves to the leading, the controlling of the Holy Spirit. We want to go to heaven, but we also at the same time want to maintain control of our lives. We want to call the shots. We want salvation. We want eternity in heaven. But here on earth, we want to be in charge. Let me state an important truth. Jesus doesn't want to just be our Savior. He wants to be the unquestionable Lord of our lives. One of the reasons that many Christians are not experiencing joy is because we have kept parts of our lives from the rule and the reign of Jesus Christ. We like to think that we're in charge. We think that we might not express it verbally, but In practice, we like to think that we're in control. We want to be in control of certain areas, our relationship with our spouse. 
And between services, I just met with someone that's relationships out of control with their spouse. We like to think we're in control with our parents as young people, as our children, as parents. We like to think that we have control. We call the shots with friendships. We like to think we're in control of our jobs, our finances, our leisure time. Maybe something else you think you're in charge of, you want to call the shots. And we are, if we're going to be honest, many of us, we're reluctant, if not outright resistant, to saying, Lord, here I am, and I give you every area of my life to do with as you choose. We have a hard time saying that and really meaning it, because we prefer to do life our way rather than God's way. And yet what we're discovering is it's not producing the results we want. And so we're living a life today, many Christians, it's a substandard life as far as Christ is concerned for his children. We're living lives that are void, empty of meaning and fulfillment and satisfaction and joy. There's something missing, and yet we persist in doing life our way, day after day. Isn't that the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing day after day and then expecting different results? And yet that's what's happening. And I'm continually meeting with people who in bed who confess, Pastor Dave, my life's a mess. My marriage is a mess. My family's a mess. My personal life is a mess. <clears throat> and when I suggest, and I told this individual today, I suggest to you this, it's unconditional surrender to Jesus Christ. But many hear that, and they refuse to take that first all-important step. It saddens me, troubles me, to hear how many people are miserable and desperately seeking happiness or joy in their everyday lives. Something's missing. Something's out of balance. Something's out of whack. This series is designed to help you experience the joy that Jesus wants you to have as you follow him. And here's my prayer for you as an individual and as a body of believers. I want us to be people who exude joy so that others are drawn to Jesus. I want people to look at you and say, whatever you have, I want. And it's not COVID. <coughs> what we should have is a vibrant relationship with Jesus that produces joy in all kinds of circumstances and situations, even and perhaps more importantly in the less than ideal situations. I'm 100% convinced if we would live out the Word of God, and that's a big if, if we adhere to the Scriptures, we learn them and we live them, that we can experience the joy of the Lord. It'll be your strength. In life. Now think of the people in your life who, when you cross paths, these individuals lift you up. They brighten your day. You come away from their presence feeling so much better. You were having a bummer of a day. It's like, wow, I feel so much better now. They, they have this uncanny knack of lifting me up. Let me ask you. How long has it been since you felt a level of contagious, infectious, unflappable, unstoppable joy? If you say, well, Pastor, if I'm going to be honest, you're talking about joy. I can't tell you the last time I felt joy, and I'll tell you what's happened. This illness or this disease robbed me of joy, robbed me of my health. The economy took my job. I'll tell you what happened. That jerk stole my heart. Most Americans freely admit that they're not joyful. Smiles are all too infrequent. Clinically depressed people are increasing in number. And if something in your life has robbed you of joy and you want it back, then I say fasten your seatbelts and get ready for God to do something in and through your life. Because you can be used in a powerful way to spread the joy of the Lord. 
And we're going to be talking about the door to joy, but know this, at the entrance to the door stands Jesus Christ. If you study the Gospels, he was accused of a lot of things, but never is he described as being grumpy or a sourpuss or a self-centered jerk. When Pastor Steve shared the parable of the lost sheep, he pointed out that people love to be around Jesus. They long to be in his presence Whenever they heard word that he was coming into their town, it says the people flocked to him. People didn't groan when he appeared. You see some people, you go, oh, no, here they come. Hey, how you doing? Yeah. You see them in the grocery store and you go, ha, I'm going down, or Walmart. You go down the house and avoid them. And your kids are going, where are you, where are you going? Well, honey, we're, we're going another aisle. And it's like, and then they run into that same house, like, hey, how you doing? You know, hopefully they're not running to avoid us. If you read the Gospels, you learn that Jesus called people by name. He listened to their stories. He answered their legitimate questions. He visited their sick relatives and friends. He hung out with fishermen. He ate lunch with those who were despised. He attended weddings. He went to parties. And he was criticized for hanging out with rowdy individuals. Literally thousands turned out to listen to his teaching. <clears throat> and many of those same people chose to follow him. Some, the gospels tell us, left their jobs to follow Jesus. He exuded joy. He wants us to do the same. When the angels made the birth announcement of Jesus to the shepherds, they said it was good news of great joy. Again, following in the bulletin, some of you may want crayons next time for the bulletin. I don't know. I hope not, you know, to draw pictures and stuff like my grandson does when we go to eat. But our joy level matters to God. And amazingly, he wants to use us to be special agents of joy. Now, it's not an easy task because we all know that some people, none here, can be fickle. Some people can be moody, none here. And some people can be extremely stubborn. Aren't you glad there's none of those people in here? We, we don't let them in here. Anybody like that? We say, you can't. Come on, who are we kidding? If we're going to be used by the Lord to give away this joy, we need a plan. We need instruction. And we find it in the more than 51 another's of the New Testament. Listen, we're not going to go through all 50 in this series. We're going to condense it to 10. We're going to talk about the first one another which Bill read for us today, give a high five or an boy or a girl to someone. Simply put, be an encourager. Some people in life are downers. When you leave their presence, you feel beat up, you feel discouraged, you feel inadequate. After talking with them, you feel like you're a failure a nobody, and you even question your self-worth. I've watched parents, sadly, verbally assault their kids by their words and the tones they use to speak to them. And I've watched them put their children down and the children crawl into a shell and their shoulders droop and their countenance, countenance communicates they're sad, these kids. They're frustrated. They're anxious. They're nervous. They're afraid to try to do anything because basically it's been communicated to them that they're no good. They're failures, and they can't possibly accomplish anything worthwhile. Parents and teachers, please understand, you play a vital role in the lives of the young people that God has entrusted to you. But listen, not just parents and teachers, because all of us have a sphere of influence. We can be used to build others up, or Satan can use us to tear others down. You adults can impact others in a positive or negative way. 
at your workplace, at the gym if you work out, at your favorite restaurant, teenagers, you can be an encourager or a discourager to your classmates, to your teammates. There are coaches and teachers that draw people to them because they are champion encouragers. Kids want to play for them. Kids want to have that teacher in school. That teacher is great. That teacher is an encourager. That teacher loves her students. That teacher loves his students. That coach is good. He builds up the team. He makes people feel important. Several years ago, I coached at Johnstown Christian School, and everybody liked to play us, the public schools. Easy win. Then you start winning, and then it's like, oh, we don't like you as much. But there was a boy, we had a very good team. We were beating public schools, and we had a boy that, honestly, I've said this, if you rolled out a pumpkin in basketball, I don't know if you know the difference. And he wasn't very good. His name was Steve. And he was on the team. He was friends with all the... He was a great teammate. Fast forward 10, 15 years, they had a fundraising banquet. Steve got up and he spoke and he said, I was not good at all. I didn't know Steve knew he wasn't good. I don't know Steve knew I knew he wasn't good. But he says, I'll never forget. It was in the gym, the fundraiser. He said, right here, I got in Coach Streets, put me in. He always encouraged me, put me in. And I made a shot, and the gym went crazy. And I'm going, that was 15 years ago. But thankfully, I was an encourager to Steve. We don't know the power of our words. Words are very powerful. Growing up, I remember a very athletically gifted boy in our neighbor. Lived across the street. We played Little League together. He was a hard thrower. He was a great athlete, one of the best, if not the best players in the league. He was on the all-star team. But his dad had his knack for bursting his son's bubble, making him feel like a failure. Instead of pointing out the good things, he would point out anything negative. That boy didn't enjoy his little league experience like he should have. I've had the privilege of having some great encouragers in my life. They saw potential in me, and they spurred me to try and not to give up. The fact is, I wouldn't be where I am today if it were not for my mom and dad and some of my coaches, teachers, professors, some of the church youth leaders, and other adults that spoke words of encouragement into my life. I've said this before. I played basketball. If you know anything about basketball, it's not good to have more fouls and points. There were games like that. It's not good to have more turnovers and points or positive things. There were games I'd come home and go, man, that was a rough game, my dad. I'd walk in, great game. I'm like, what game were you at? You weren't at the one I was playing. But it was like, wow. One thing I try to do with my grandson, Ashton, he swims, he runs, and he uh, plays soccer. And I try to tell him, Ashton, you don't have to win every time. You're not going to win every time. You're not going to score a goal every time. You're not going to make a bad, a, a great pass every time. You're going to kick the ball out of bounds. You're going to, it's okay. It's okay. And he was at a practice for a sport, and the coach wasn't really building him up. He did the thing really, well, I don't want to say what sport, he did the thing really well. Five, six, seven times the coach didn't say anything. Then one time it wasn't quite right, and the coach pointed out, and I was looking at him, and I'm like, wow. I, I said, listen, Ashton, you're not always going to do everything perfect. You just keep trying. You do it for the Lord. Ask Him to help you. He goes, Pap, you know what I like about you? I never do anything wrong. Well, that's not true. <laughs> he does some things wrong. And when he does, I tell him, quit acting like his dad. Because the streets, <laughs> street side of the family wouldn't act like that. But um, encouraging, trying to encourage people. I've had the privilege of coaching some great kids who were skilled at encouraging the rest of their teammates. Those kids were loved by their peers. God offers encouragement to us. Romans 15, verse 5. So does our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. It says He offers us encouragement. He gives encouragement. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 16 to 17. The Holy Spirit who lives in us, if we're children of God, is called the Comforter, the Encourager. 
The Bible, Paul said, the Bible is written to encourage us. So if you want to be encouraged, read the Bible. It's there for our instruction, our benefit. I used to love participating in 5Ks, races. Runners encourage you to keep on. And I remember being running at South Fork, a lot of hills in that course. Today, when I look at a hill, I just take the car up the hill now. But I remember running in this race. It was in July. It was really hot. Another guy from the church I was pastoring was there. And it was called That Damn Race. It was around the South Fork Dam. We're running. It's, this was a 10K. And I, I don't know. I got halfway through it. Steep hill. So I start walking. Someone comes behind. Hey, come on. Let's go. Let's go. You can make it. It's downhill after this. He forgot to tell me after the downhill, it went back uphill again. <laughs> but I was running with him and then running with some other people. And this just tells you how bad I was. If you want humble, there's guys with beer bellies passing me, little kids passing me. I'm like, okay, that's, it is what it is. I'm not going to knock myself out. But I was running with about four or five people. And this one guy, he's like, man, I feel pretty good for just having major knee surgery. I'm going, whoa, I don't have anything wrong with me. And I'm barely able to keep up with you. That's an encouragement. But <clears throat> Hebrews 12.1 says that the saints in having the cloud of witnesses stand by to encourage us by their example. We read about them in Hebrews 11, and we go, wow, look at what they did for Christ. Look what they did for God. Look how they stood up. If they stood up for their faith, so can I. They're urging us by their example to finish strong. Encouragement happens when we come alongside and we call out. Encouragement quite literally is pouring courage into someone else to keep on going, to do life. Jesus modeled encouragement throughout his earthly ministry. Time doesn't permit it, but in Matthew 16, 13 to 18, he's going to Caesarea Philippi. And if you know anything about the apostle Peter, he seemed to have foot and mouth disease. He was always ready to offer an opinion to say something, even though it may have been the wrong thing. He had this uncanny knack of speaking before he thought. He was prone to boasting too much. Nevertheless, Jesus saw something in this crude, this crass fisherman that was worth pointing out. In Matthew 16, they're in the city of Caesarea Philippi, which is a melting pot of people. All kinds of sights and sounds in this metropolitan city. A lot of temples and a lot of deities being worshipped in those temples. Religion was to Caesarea Philippi what food is or produce is to a farmer's market. There are lots of deities from which to choose to follow. It was in this conglomeration of religion and culture that Jesus asked his disciples, hey, you've been with me and you've been with the people. Who do they think I am? Who do the people think I am? What are they saying about me? Well, some of them think that you're John the Baptist. Come back to life because if you read in Matthew 14, John had been beheaded. Well, they think you're John. Come back to life. Well, no. Others, uh, they think that you're Elijah the prophet who's come back from death. No. Others think you're Jeremiah the weeping prophet or one of the other prophets. And then Jesus said, okay, guys. You've been listening to me, watching me, traveling with me three years. Who do you think that I am? And Peter spoke up immediately. You are the Christ. You're the Messiah. You're God's anointed one. You are the son of the living God. And Jesus immediately commends Peter for his correct response. We can, he said, blessed are you, Peter. And you didn't figure it out on your own. My father has revealed it to you. But we can paraphrase it this way. Jesus says, right on, Peter. You're the man. You said it. You got it right. And then he gave the equivalent of a standing ovation, high five or a chest bump. And read on in verse 18. He gave him, a, you're Simon, but you're now going to be called Peter. Peter comes from Petros, meaning rock. Think how Peter must have felt at that moment. Guys, hey, the rest of you, did you hear what Jesus called me? He called me rock or rocky, a word of affirmation. Jesus did for Peter what encouragers do. He brought out 
the best. He built Peter up. Encouragers use their words and their actions to build others up. And that pays huge dividends. Marriage research reveals an interesting characteristic of a healthy, a happy, a joyful marriage. Listen carefully. Think about your marriage. There is a positive to negative ratio of five to one. In other words, for every negative comment made, every negative criticism, five positive words are spoken. Five deeds of encouragement are done. Those of you that are married, think about how you interact with your spouse. Is there more building up or tearing down? And you know, you can fool me. You can walk in and look like the happy family, but I've talked to some in our church. If you lived in our house, you wouldn't recognize it because it's completely different at home the way we interact with each other at home. How about you as parents and your interaction with your children? How about if you are a teacher or a coach? How are you and how is it with you and your friends? What's your work environment like? Is there more destructive behavior and ripping of others? Or is there more genuine complimenting and edifying of one another? Because quite often I talk to people and they say, my work environment's toxic. People are unhappy. People are miserable. People are cutthroat. And I've always told Mallory this. You know, <clears throat> when you're at a nurse station and they're talking about other nurses, don't join them. Because when you're not there, they're going to be talking about you. And they're going to be saying, you did that. And you said that. I hear horror stories of people's homes and workplaces. And the result is this, gloom and doom, negative feedback, disillusionment, pessimism, depression, anxiety. That's what's going on in America. The one who is an encourager has the ability to see the potential in you and to call it out with words of affirmation. I believe in you. I think you can do something good. You have worth. My daily prayer is that God will use me to be an encourager to whomever he brings into my life. Be it my wife, Sandy, my daughter, Mallory, my favorite son-in-law, Jeremy. I only have one son-in-law, in case some of you don't know. My grandsons, Ashton and Finn. The staff members that I get the privilege of working alongside. Church attenders or people out in the community like the cashiers, the wait staff, the people you see walking down the out wall. I don't know about you. I like to study people. Sometimes I'm walking in the hall at Conoma or something. Everybody's always looking down. They don't look at you. They don't make eye contact. Do you ever be in a line? Were you ever in a line at... Walmart or somewhere, someone's just ripping the cashier. It's like, wow, that's embarrassing. That's awkward. I try to build them up. Sometimes I go, man, I feel for you didn't deserve to be treated that way. That's a sad thing, you know. Every person needs to hear a wonderful once in a while. Lots of money, when you think about it, is spent in advertising telling us we're not okay, that we're somehow deficient. Think about it. To sell beauty materials like creams, they tell us that our face and our skin's wrinkled. I was at eye care in Richland, and they had a, one of those telecommercials on there. It was all about, and I learned something. I was watching, I got to say, did you see that? How that just takes away all your wrinkles like that. And I go, I learned something. They call these, there's two little lines here, and some people, they're called 11. The two ones there. And it's like, if you put this cream on, those ones disappear. You must have to put on about that thick to disappear. I don't know. But I'm like, wow, why do we have to feel bad if we get wrinkles? Or <clears throat> to get us to buy dyed products, 
they tell us we're overweight. To convince us to buy new clothes, they tell us our clothes are out of style. I say, just hang on to your clothes, they'll come back in style. Marketing companies do their utmost to tell us that we're chubby, we're smelly, we're ugly, we're out of date. I think maybe we can relate to the two cows grazing in the field when a milk truck drove by. Well, the truck didn't drive by. Someone drove the truck by, okay? But on the side of the truck were the words pasteurized, homogenized, standardized, vitamin A. One cow said to the other, makes you feel quite inadequate, doesn't it? Many individuals sadly are wrestling with feelings of inadequacy. So knowing that, we should prayerfully ask God to use us to reach out to others with heartfelt words and deeds of encouragement. Look around you. Listen. Ask God to open your eyes and your ears, your hearts, your minds to discover someone who could use a word of affirmation. The co-worker who clearly feels inferior. The kid in your class, young people, who's withdrawn. Sometimes it breaks my heart when I hear kids wrestling with feeling accepted in school. The person in your family who always seems beat down. A neighbor, when you talk to the neighbor, seems discouraged and depressed. So the question is, will you allow God to use you to communicate to others that they're loved by Jesus and that you love them as well? That they're created in the image of God and that God is for them and God's not against them? Look to Simon Peter's in your life. Look them in the eye and call forth the rock in them. You say, Pastor, how do I encourage others? Glad you asked. Pay attention. Ask God to help you be a good listener. <clears throat> Mark chapter 5, and you can turn if you will, but I'm not going to read the whole passage. But in Mark chapter 5, I've been easy on you today, not making you look up verses. Mark 5. 25 to 33, Jesus is on his way to tend to the very ill daughter of a ruler of the synagogue, a man by the name of Jairus. As he's walking, a woman who had been hemorrhaging for years and who had exhausted her resources without a resolution, in desperation, she reaches out and grabs hold of Jesus' garment. And immediately, she's healed. And Jesus knew that divine power got out from him, and he asked, he stops, and he says, who touched me? And the disciples are incredulous, like, well, Jesus, look around. People are bumping into each other. It's like you're at a concert or waiting in to get into a sporting event. And you want to know who, look, Jesus, what kind of question is that? No, Jesus knew someone touched him in faith and divine power had gone out of him. And so he touched me. And the woman realized that she couldn't hide. She came down and fell before Jesus. And in verse 33 of Matthew 5, Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Now the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. She told Jesus her entire story. How long has it been since someone had genuinely listened to that woman's story? Jesus took the time to hear her speak. He could have said, lady, look, cut to the chase. I got to get to Jairus' daughter. I'm in a big hurry. Give me the Reader's Digest version of your story. I don't have time to listen to all the details of your life. But he didn't react that way. He stopped what he was doing. And listen, what he was doing was important because he was going to this very sick girl to heal her. He listened attentively. I pray all the time in my prayer journal, Lord, help me to be a good listener. You ever talk to somebody and you know they're not listening? I used to say that. My dad, I said he's my hero, but I could have stopped up at the church when I was at Westmont and he was in Richland. I didn't stop in that often, but I'd stop in and he'd be writing notes or letters to people. And how you doing? And I could have said, Dad, the church burned down and 10 people burned. Oh, that's good. That's nice. Glad to hear that. It's like... It's like I go saying, I don't even know why I stopped. He wasn't listening. 
We know people like that. Jesus took the time to listen. Here's the thing. I don't want to stereotype, but women are creatures of detail. If you ask a man how his day was, he's probably going to go, good. What does that mean? What does that mean? Well, I don't need to go. It was good. You ask a woman, you might be there for quite a while hearing what she did from the first time she got up and then all through the day, what she did, what she had for lunch, you know, and all that stuff. How many ice cubes were in her drink and all these things. And it's like, oh, whoa. So I pray, Lord, help me to be a good listener. Because sometimes I'll come home and Sandy will be there, blah, 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 blah. And I'll go, slow down. She goes, I know I only got your attention for so long. And then you drift off. That's not a compliment. I tell her, you and your mom have the gift of making a short story into a long one. Some of you didn't get that, all right? It's a short story, but you make it into a long story. Her mother would go, uh, last thir- was that Thursday, Friday, two, what the, um, that car was brown, was it brown, was it blue, was it, well, was it a Ford, was it, a- I don't care, get to the story. But we need to be listening to people. The miracle that Jesus did, he wanted to hear her story, but think about this. The miracle restored that woman's health. The listening that Jesus did restored her dignity. Do the same for someone else. Ask them to tell you their story. Because listen, every person has a story. And when I hear people's story, I'll come home and tell them, wow, that's crazy what happened to them in life. And I had no idea that that's their past. I had no idea that. It helps me appreciate them a little more to see where they're coming from and see what God has done. As people are telling you their story, fight the urge to interrupt them or to tell them to speed up by going, you know, sometimes we're looking around and we're, Hey, how you doing over there? How you doing over there? And they're like, I'm talking to you, and we're not listening. Turn off your TV or your phone or your computer. Give the rarest of gifts your undivided attention. Second thing is we wind it down. Don't close your Bibles and get your purses ready and all those things you do right at the end. I'll call over to Eaton Park and reserve your table. (laughs) Praise people lavishly and sincerely. Hebrews 10, 24 says, Consider how you might spur one another to love and good works. The idea is understanding. Stop and think. Do you know someone, anyone who needs genuine heartfelt encouragement? Let me assure you, you do know someone. In your life, that needs encouragement. I'm appreciative, I said to the people in my life that are genuine encouragers. I have a lady, she was at the first service, I didn't want to point her out. She has this great gift of sending cards, and she doesn't just send a card, she writes beautiful messages. I'm like, wow, that's beautiful. I keep those cards. I told her, you have the gift of encouragement. Ministry's hard. You're at the top of my list. I have another guy. He texts me. Hey, I'm praying for you this morning. The gift of encouragement. Everyone, including this pastor, needs a cheerleader. 1 Thessalonians 5.15, the message says, look for the best in each other and always do your best to bring it out. And then Acts 20.20, 20, the message. It's a paraphrase. Paul says, I didn't skimp or trim in any way. Every truth and encouragement that could have made a difference to you, you got. We all love to be encouraged. So I say this year, let's make it our prayerful aim to imitate Jesus and the Apostle Paul by going all in and encouraging one another. Give the gift that God loves to give, the gift of encouragement. We have people all around us beat up, anxious, stressed, hurting, hopeless. Let's be used of God to lift them out of that pit. Let's pray. 
as our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, do you know God personally? The God we've been talking about, is he your father through faith in Jesus? You say, Pastor, I don't know. I know he's not my father. I want God in my life. I want to be a child of God. How do I do that? You can pray a prayer similar to this in the quietness of your own heart. Dear Lord Jesus, today I admit, I acknowledge that I'm a sinner and I'm sorry for my sin. I'm thankful you died on the cross for me. Please forgive me. And Jesus, I'm putting my faith in you. I'm inviting you into my life to be my Savior. I want you to be the ruler of my life from now on. Thank you for saving me. So our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. If you prayed that prayer, just ask you to slip your hand. I'm not going to point you out in any manner whatsoever. You say, Pastor, today I asked Jesus into my life. Perhaps there are those who say, God's spoken to me. I realize that I'm supposed to be a person of joy. I realize one of the steps of having joy in my life is by following the scriptures and specifically of being an encourager to others. Pastor, would you pray for me that I might be an encourager this year? Yes. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your love. Thank you that you are the God of comfort. You're the God that encourages. You've given us your spirit to encourage us. You've given us examples of godly men and women in the scriptures. And Lord, you've given us your word. You've equipped us to be encouragers. So Lord, help us to be doers of your word and not just hearers. Lord, I pray that throughout 2022, as you tarry, Lord, that this body of believers would be a body that encourages those that we come in contact with, those in the body of Christ, those outside of the body of Christ. Lord, I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.